Hello and welcome to episode 22 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 16th of October 2017. I'm Joe and with me are Jesse. Freshly showered. <laughs> Ike. Very freshly showered. And failing. With a blowout buffet. <laughs> yes, so uh, the two of you are in the midst of a hurricane, which we shouldn't really make jokes about because people have died. So uh, yeah, and we probably shouldn't mention people dying at the top of the show. That's not uh, conducive to a good time, but you've made it. We're here. We're doing this. Uh, let's hope that the power stays on and the internet stays on long enough to record. So let's start with the excellent, excellent news that the Librem 5 has been funded. Yay, they reached their target. Yay. And so now it's happening. So now, now safe in the knowledge that it's going to happen, we're all going to back this, right? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I'll um, do that tomorrow. <laughs> uh, there's no internet at all or anything. Ah, uh, did you see that all the banks were closed as well? I, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know which way we're going to do this now, you know. Let's take that as a no then. So they're already at uh, 1,750,000 as we record it. So they're well on the way to 2 million. But is it enough? Is it enough to do what they want to do, do we think? Well, how much is one phone? <laughs> well, they are charging $600 for it. Uh, a grand, don't worry. <laughs> I'd be amazed if it's enough. But I mean, I heard somebody say, you know, I don't know how true this is, that it wasn't a brand new phone. They're basing it on a um, previous piece of kit, and then they're going to modify that kit. Well, they have got a prototype board already, and I've seen some photos of that running, but they're still waiting for the newer processor, aren't they? The i.mx8 or whatever it is, which is... Um, coming very soon and they're hoping it's going to have the free drivers but they're kind of hedging their bets with the slightly older six version of it so they don't actually have anything concrete yet but it's it's gonna take a lot isn't it well can i just rain on this parade ever so slightly so if i remember rightly this is very much a voice over ip phone right uh well yeah it's kind of both they're pushing the the vibe stuff so that it can run totally free software, but so it can normal phone too. Yeah, yeah, it's got um, a, a normal baseband in it, so you can use it as a phone, but okay. you can not install the drivers for that. I think that'll probably be an option. Cool, because the stretch goal is voice over IP stuff, which is supposed to be one of the main selling points, and that's a stretch goal of four million. Yeah, which is just not going to happen, is it? No, not even remotely. Run Android applications in isolation on the Librem Five, ten million. Well, to be fair, that would take a lot of work, wouldn't it? It would take a hell of a lot of work to make Android apps work. Um, Why, though? We've already got them working on Linux with Anbox. Yeah, exactly. It's Linux. The stuff already exists. Yeah, but come on. <laughs> Get cheaper <that> developers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Find it all out to the Far East or something, yeah. But, well, the thing is, to make Android apps work, sort of all right-ish is possible now with Anbox, but to make them work flawlessly is another matter, especially with all the Google Play services stuff that you need. Well, they wouldn't do Google Play services because that's not free. No, but they could maybe have that optional. I don't know. Mm. Maybe not. But at least F-Droid would be nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the plus side, they are actually building it, and there is actually going to be a development kit, and people would be able to make stuff for it. So, yay. Well, that brings me to my question. Have you any interest in making Solus work on it once it happens? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but that's not that's me being unfair against purism. That's, that is me being unfair because I have no interest in phones. I have no interest in Solus being on phones. Like if at one point I have to do it, it'd be a derived thing of Solus. It wouldn't be Solus itself, but no. But what if someone really wanted to do it? Would you facilitate that? Would you help them out? Um... I mean, it's, it, yeah, it's doable, right? It, it it depends on your... I mean, what architecture is the phone? It's going to be something like a Snapdragon, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, it's it's an ARM processor, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's sort of your gotcha there. There'd have to be significant demand for ARM. But, you know, if push comes to shove and people wanted ARM support generically in Zolus, then yeah, we could probably enable that. But as for us chasing phones, nah. But it would be nice to see some actual innovation happen in the phone market. You know, I'm not saying they're going to succeed or they're going to fail. It's a, it's an unknown because they've actually got the funding. And the last ones who tried to do that didn't quite get there. 
Well, no, Shuttleworth had to fund it last time because he mm. went for whatever ridiculous number it was, 14 million or no, more than that, I think. It's like 25, I think. But wow. may- maybe 25 is a realistic target to make the phone that Ubuntu wanted to make. You know, that was incredibly high specs at the time. And if they're if the Librem people are backing off of a, an existing phone, I'm not saying that's the right or wrong way. It might be a more sensible way of doing it. Uh, you know, they're going to have, have a, a cheaper goal or lower goal, sorry. But some of these, I have to say, some of these stretch goals do look a little bit like the way that I make some of my New Year predictions and just, sort of, <laughs> um, this might happen. Right, let's put that down. What, what should we have it as? Six or eight? Oh, eight million. There we go. You know, free, <laughs> free encrypted VPN tunnels for everyone for a year. There we go. Lovely. It just, it does seem a bit odd. And the other thing that's a bit odd about this is, is some of the last minute funding that came in rather than a, you know, uh, lots of people funding small amounts or the $600 that it is for each phone. There's a few really big backers towards the end, which... So I see you've bought into Popey's graph conspiracy then. So if the if you want to put money towards a project and you're a big company, why have, hasn't that big company just put money into the project and they've done it, you know, off to one side and then have released a phone? If, if the big company or, you know, an investor with millions and millions of pounds is putting these massive lumps in right towards the end, right just to, so we hit the target, it all sounds a little bit like they had someone in mind anyway, and they've done this, as I think, I hope Joe will back me up because he seems to have said it a couple of times, you know, to sort of peddle the PR campaign, and they were going to get it funded anyway. Oh, that's an interesting take on it. Um, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a case of an eccentric millionaire who cares a lot about free software. And we know there are at least two of those. I can think of one. <laughs> well, you've met one recently, but there is another one as well. Blue, whoever runs Blue Systems, you know, the KDE side of things. So there are people out there who are rich and care about software freedom. And maybe they wanted to push it over the edge. And so that's why they they bought those $20,000 ones and decided, okay, we're going to put in, or well, I'm going to put in 60,000, so I'll do three of those or whatever it ended up being. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe it was calculated because the thing is, the it, the whole thing felt quite carefully orchestrated from a PR point of view, didn't it? From the beginning, they announced it, they got a load of publicity then they announced that Gnome were on board, they got a load more. Then they announced that KDE were on board, they got a load more. Um, and and Matrix and all the rest of it. And so it, it does feel like it was very well planned. And you have to say hats off to them because they do care about software freedom and you need to have a bit of that PR stuff going on. Otherwise, you just end up with loads of dull shit that no one cares about. At least they've drummed up the support for this and they've made or they've brought in more than their goal, you know, the best part of $2 million to to make this thing happen that we've desperately wanted to happen for so long. Because even with the Ubuntu side of things, that was still running proprietary bullshit underneath it, wasn't it? All the Android stuff. Yeah. Whereas this is going to be, if it works out and if they do deliver on their goal, well, their promise at this point, we're going to have a totally free software phone, which we haven't had before. So fair play to them, I reckon. I've got to ask the derailing question here. Just one derailing question. You said that uh, it's the thing we've desperately wanted. Why have we desperately wanted it? Well, we is uh, a term. It depends who we is. Uh, there are certain... I would. <laughs> well, yeah. Mr. No Google Apps, you've got the closest thing to this at the moment, which is Lineage with no G apps. Yeah. And this is just a step further, isn't it? Yeah, and the, the, I mean, the thing I would see would be that it doesn't mean that you it means that you don't get stuck on a horrifically old kernel version for ever, essentially. So, from your perspective, you would get the the sort of experience you've been seeking without the Googles, without the anti free parts of the existing mobile world, but as a genuine product and not something botched together. Yeah, I mean. I think that's pretty cool. I don't mind doing a bit of work myself, but I mean, I am getting lazier the older I get. Uh, but it would be nice to be able to get a device that doesn't automatically brick itself, essentially, by it being invalid after a few years, like my soon-to-be wireless router. So you get to be treated like a customer, and you get to preserve your freedoms. Yep. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? Mm. All right, well, uh, let's move on. 
and rattle through a couple of these. There's some KDA stuff that you care about, Phelan. Tell us what's great <laughs> about Convergence with a K. It was just a quick one. It, um, one of them was the Convergence article. Uh, it's a bit in-depth. It's probably a bit boring to talk about here, but um, I think we should chuck the link in anyway. It's one of the guys that's heavily involved in what could become the new OS for the Librem phone. So I thought it was quite interesting using the... Um, new KDE tools that they've got developed for Plasma 5 and stuff. Well, they're not that new, but it, they're starting to develop on those to, to integrate them into a fully convergent device. And not to be convergent as in one size fits all, but to just have a really good toolkits that allow you to develop different apps for different sizes, different views on the same sort of data. I mean, the area that convergence kind of fell down with Ubuntu, as as far as I could see, was that, yeah, it was nice if you had something on your desktop, something on your tablet, something on your phone of different sizes, and it, it did its auto decision as to how big it had to be depending on what screen it was on. But someone's got to write the, that one code base three times, you know, to, to put all the right things in the right places depending on what size it's going to be. And are they looking at having all of the software, you know, all the K software can run on the phone or just like a couple of odd bits like the clock will run on everything and the calculator <laughs> will run it you know the the things that you get installed with your phone as standard versus all the useful apps that you actually use every day that's a good question i'm not 100 percent sh- sure um i think they're looking to make it easy to sort of split off the bits that are unique and then merge all the bits that are the same theory it's super fast and easy to do ike might debate that but you know i think they're working on that and they're working on the structures that are required or missing from that as well so yeah i mean i think it's going to be a bit of a see how good they can get it to go okay i mean you're, you're echoing what i've noticed with the general sort of kde view on on plasma on devices and, and convergence is let's look at what we can do let's let's sort of dip our toes into it try and do some of the technical background, see where we get, without some sort of grand holistic plan as to how it's going to be or saying in a year's time we'll have a phone release or whatever, just this is a good way of going, we're going to see what we can do and in six months' time we'll tell you how we've done and how we're going to move on. So, you know, there may well not be an answer to my question, hence you don't know it, but it does seem like the sort of way that KDE and the Plasma team have gone about this to to just see what they can do and and see what's what comes out at the end. Yeah, they do seem to be quite modest and humble about the mobile side of things, don't they? They seem to be very honest, I think is the best way to think about it, that you've got a phone that is kind of a nice idea, it's a nice proof of concept, but they are by no means saying it is a product yet. And they're taking slow and steady steps towards that happening and they're not making any bold claims like Ubuntu used to. So that's what I really appreciate about it. Yeah, and it's not just sort of a new KDE Linux desktop or uh, mobile that they're aiming for too. You're able to use the you know the Kirigami toolkit on Android as well. So to try and make it useful for more than just the ideal that might happen, they've actually got it rolling out onto proper apps already. I mean, if you take uh, Subsurface as one of the things they talk about, which was ported to QT from GTK, you know, that's Linus's favorite diving tool thing that he uses when he goes like aqualong diving, I mean, and uh, they ported that to QT, but then that allowed them to use QT quick through it. And then they made a mobile version of it real fast. So kind of handy if you're out diving in a boat, you can actually use your phone to do your dive computer stuff and God knows what. You can tell I'm obviously a diver, so I know all about these things, but... (laughs) Yeah, you've got the physique for it, yeah. You are dead. Oh. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, so Plasma 5.11 is out as well, which you've put in, Phelim. I had a quick look at it. It's, again, slow and steady improvements. There's nothing major, is there, in there? Um, there's a few nice things. Uh, Vaults is really cool. Um, I haven't got enough of a use of it yet to give it a full sort of review, but... Um, it's like a virtual sort of drive where you can store encrypted data. And if you use CryFS, which is supposedly secure and they have no claims that it isn't, uh, you can use that, which is quite compatible with things like uh, Dropbox, OwnCloud and all that sort of stuff. So uh, quite handy for storing a bunch of encrypted data about clients or whatever and 
having that auto sync up to a server and not having to do joint big blobs. You know, it does it in a, a smaller sort of uh, file size, but it doesn't give away what's inside there either. So you don't know that, oh, look, if we batter away on passwords.txt, we'll eventually get it. Oh, that seems quite useful. I wonder if it will come to other desktop environments and stuff. Hopefully not, and we get to keep it and <laughs> shout at you that you don't have it. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, because that, that's what free software is all about, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah, it is. <laughs> Sticking fingers in eyes. Well, I mean, the KDE guys have obviously got the memo about uh, updating their system settings to have what now I think most uh, distributions have, which is this, like all of the headings down the left-hand side and then the main bulk of the window changes to display your, your heading. So it used to be you kind of click on the heading and the whole window changes yeah. to show you what you've got. And now, because I was looking at, when we come to it, uh, a review later, and they've got this as well. And so it, it does seem like someone sent a memo to a bunch of distributions and, and uh, uh, desktop environments. Like, right, this is the way that we go with system settings. Fall in line. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, just looked at the XFCE ones. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't look like that to me. But yeah, you're right. That does seem to be the modern way to do it. So um, yeah, it, I hate, I find myself hating Plasma less and less with every update. <laughs> feel, like. feel the love. <laughs> yeah. That's an endorsement and a half, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a glowing endorsement. Um, right, so uh, let's all take the piss out of Jesse for not running Lineage on his OnePlus 3, is it? It is the OnePlus 3. So, Ike, you know you're asking why anyone would want this uh, super open, super free, read the code type phone. Yeah. Uh, I'm sort of surprised that the guys didn't did stick it in me then. But um, sorry, I was not afraid of the juice. You have to get me drunk first. <laughs> At least by dinner. So, um, yeah, this is the news that uh, someone's done some digging around in the OnePlus uh, Oxygen OS, uh, which is the the tweak to Android that comes as standard on OnePlus phones. And there's uh, some information that's being sent out by the phone <laughs> back to OnePlus. All um, of the information. So, yeah, I think, I think we've pretty much covered it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. It's not at all over the top whatsoever. <laughs> it's only a small bit of data going out, though, right? I'd be surprised there's not video as well and audio, a constant, a constant audio stream from your phone. Not group. And <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, it is going over HTTPS. So, you know. Oh, that's fine then. You know, as long as they receive all your information securely, <laughs> who cares, <laughs> and right? store it carefully for whoever might need it. Yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't look good at all for them, does it? it it's just a very bad look and... So I'm just so fucking glad, man, that the first thing I did was what you did, Faye. Yeah. Well, you couldn't use yours for a while, could you? Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I may have accidentally put the 3 and not the 3T image on mine for the very first day I did it. And I just realized as I did it, I went, oh, God, no. And then I had to do the recovery procedure. Oh, shit. You're lucky you didn't totally brick it. Yeah, I am, yeah. That was embarrassing. It's a good thing nobody knows about that. <laughs> well, by the time I got mine, thankfully, it was um, there was just one image for it for both phones. But so, Jesse, has this tempted you to come to the lineage light side? So, I mean, it's always been on my to do, but I have to say that the Oxygen OS isn't as offensive as most of the stock Androids you get on things like Samsungs and Sony's, and so I've been less I've been less inclined to uh, to make the move. But I, I agree that, yes, this has sort of maybe go, okay, this is probably the tipping point. I should put an evening aside and move all my apps over and sort it out and what have you. But I, I do also sort of think that, yeah, I'm the fool guy for this one because I've got that phone and I've not put Lineage on it. But I mean, I do not think that you could basically point at almost any electronic device and in a fortnight's time we'll have a bit of news about that like everyone's bt router has been hacked or everyone's firmware on these types of hp laptops is vulnerable or this thing over that it just feels like i'm the unlucky one but it doesn't sit in your pocket like you don't strap your laptop to your crotch and then wander about <laughs> with it so it does know quite a bit of info about that you. is, the, that is no way failure i'm not letting you have that so your laptop has you know banking details as all your personal i dare say your phone does too yeah but you can't just say 
you, your phone is a problem. My laptop's fine. Your laptop's just got just, got just as much stuff. No, but your phone, your laptop stays rotting in a bag or stays on a desk. It's not switched on all the time everywhere with you. Well, I don't know. I think that is just a bullshit argument, really, that just because everyone else is doing bad things, they are fine to do it. They do need to be called out, and every other phone manufacturer that's doing this needs to be called out as well. It just so happens that the, the kind of person who's got a OnePlus phone is probably geeky enough to sniff the traffic and see exactly what's going on with it. But I would have thought that a lot of other companies are doing this. Uh, maybe not to this extent, but they are certainly collecting metrics and data about their users. Isn't it great when you don't have a data plan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apart from that. But I, I'm not saying, oh, loads of other bad stuff happens. Let's Let's just ignore it all. I'm just sort of pointing out on the, yes, I should move over to Lineage and evade this problem. That's been highlighted. I have no excuse to not move over. But it, like I say, in, in a fortnight's time, it just seems like any object that's connected to the internet and electronic or is hackable or on Wi-Fi or whatever is, is, is prime for having this sort of news story. And I'm not saying that just because everyone's doing it, it's okay. I'm saying everything is fucking fucked at the moment. Well, we will get to that towards the end of the news, probably at the end of the news. But um, all right, let's 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 move on from that and let's talk about more phone shit that's going <laughs> to really uh, enthrall Ike. But it's not just phones. The, the Google event happened in the last couple of weeks uh, where they announced the Pixel 2 and the Pixel 2 XL and loads of other shit. I, I don't think we need to really go into it that much. Is there anything that jumped out at anyone? Anything that really caught your eye from this event? Blatantly, it's the super creepy camera. <laughs> Google Clips. Yeah, so uh, it's a camera that sits there and doesn't record all day long like video, but it, it tries to spot what is a good thing that's happened in your house or an interesting event, and then we'll take a photo and send you that photo. So maybe you throw your child in the air whilst cooking and flipping a pancake and it takes a photo of that moment that you wouldn't have been able Wait, to capture. While. <laughs> and reports you to chat abuse, I hope. <laughs> As you end up with a, a pancake in your hand, and, well, where did my child go? That's a good reason to have this camera. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that. Oh, yeah, maybe that'll get sent straight to the authorities. Anyway, so it's a photo that you wouldn't have been able to take or wouldn't have thought of taking, which, like, sounds like... I don't, do you know what I mean? Like, it sounds like a clever idea, but oh my fuck, just the point of having a camera in your place all the time, you know, to call it Orwellian is just an understatement. Yeah, it's it's really scary. And it's going to be uh, videos as well that this thing's taking, although with no sound. And it just makes you wonder what it's what it's going to be doing. It's, this is the kind of thing that sounds like a good idea in a Silicon Valley um, meeting, but then... In the real world, I just can't see people going for this. Or are people that they will desensitized? I mean, like with all Alexas and all, and all that shit as oh, well. They will. It's, I mean, that's another thing they announced, like more Google Home stuff. I mean, are any of you lot into the idea? I mean, obviously <laughs> failing, you're not going to be because it's proprietary software. But like, Jesse, you're generally up for all this new bollocks. Like, do you have any desire to <laughs> have a... a <laughs> Do you work in VR? <laughs> uh, so I am a, an, a, an Alexa and Google Assistant and whatever, and I hope I'm setting them all off, but um, a, free, a free household. But you do use it on your phone, though? Uh, yes. For things that are awkward to do with your fingers that are quicker <laughs> by voice. So hey, just like these, these are perfectly reasonable sentences. <laughs> So, like, sometimes it's you want to set a reminder to uh, go get the newspaper because, you know, you you want to check the odds on something or other the next day. An antiquated example. But it's quicker to say, <laughs> you know, hit the little microphone and say, add, a, add an event for this, blah, 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 done. And it will say, do you, want this? do you mean this? Yes, done. And it's quicker than typing it. Or ser- like I search. I, I have got to the point of walking down the street checking that there's no one within like 10 meters of me <laughs> and then speaking because texting and walking is really fucking awkward or like just typing i mean typing and walking i'd rather get hit by a bus <laughs> i will check i'm away from traffic and in a safe and reasonable to do so i will say okay google find me the nearest pub and i'm, I'm off 
Do you remember like when people used to look up and ask people, it's like, here, do you know a pop around there? I'm sorry, <laughs> you didn't say Alexa. Yeah, God forbid that you actually speak to someone. So human. you said about would, pe- would people buy these? So I have an instant answer to that. You can go into a garage and buy a selfie stick. Secondly, the creepiest sentence in the whole of this thing Google has come out with a camera that uses artificial intelligence to capture intimate moments that you aren't able to get on your own. Yeah. Saying nothing else. Uh, I'm just wondering how many people are going to get caught wanking by this. <laughs> yeah. And there's going to be no sound as well, so everything is going to be without context. Yeah. Just wandering around your flat, tossing it off. Anyway, bizarre. More. It's because he's got a selfie stick, hasn't he? <laughs> uh, right, anything else from the Google event or are we moving on? Nah, move on. All right, so Ike, you are saving gaming on Linux, according uh, to the headline that I wrote. Bose? <laughs> I'm enthused. <laughs> yeah, so you, what's all this about base snaps and uh, Linux Steam integration, which is, I swear LSI stands for something else, and you've stolen that acronym. Probably. Yeah, so what's tell us in uh, uh, one of those newfangled double tweets length, what, what, what's all this about? How long's the double tweet? Wait, how long's the single? Shut up! Right. <laughs> the tweet's one forty, isn't it? Right, oh, don't make me math. Um, yeah, one forty, and uh, fuck it, whatever. Anyway, tell us in without going into too much detail. All of the snaps now they depend on something called the core snap, which is currently based on Ubuntu. Right, I want to make one that's based on Solus, and not for egotistical reasons. Although that's a slight part of it. Basically, it would provide all the runtime work we've done to make Steam actually work properly on Solus available to everyone. So we'd have our build of Linux Steam integration, which I'll get to in a second, and Steam, depending on our runtime, not using any of the host libraries. So all of a sudden, you're not having all of these random issues that you have right now, not able to use open drivers, or you don't have this particular version of a library, or this thing conflicts with that thing. Right now, it's an awful sorry mess because of the fact that you've got your host OS and parts of another runtime trying to work together. It's completely ugly. So what I want to do is go further than the existing Steam runtime and have everything in there that it's going to need, completely isolated from the rest of your system, so that it actually just works. The Linux Steam integration part of it goes a long way to undo all the bits of magical voodoo that make the games currently work, in that they don't, <laughs> um, because so much has changed in Linux in the last few years. I'm well over the double tweet length now. <laughs> but <laughs> um, like all the magic they have to do, like overriding the library path and preloading certain libraries, it undoes all that. It forces it to look in different places for libraries. It renames them on the fly as it's doing the loading. Like it doesn't actually touch any files. It literally just takes over the dynamic linker and tells it how to look for libraries afterwards. So we put both of those things together. We create a snap out of it. Then anyone could use that snap and that runtime to run Steam on any snap supporting Linux distribution and get the same experience everywhere without any of the compatibility issues. It would just work. The good thing about that is not just for the users, then the developers would have one consistent thing to target, not 480,000 different distributions. So that means then that if you're on, say, Arch, and you do sudo snap install um, the Steam thing, Linux Steam integration. Yeah, I mean, we'll come up with a better name before then, but we can go with your one from now. Yeah, so LSI, whatever, it'll pull that down as well as your core one. Yeah. But if you are on Solus, then it obviously has that core one anyway, and so that is basically a dependency at that point. So you'd still use it on Solus because... I mean, there's going to get to a point where we can't keep our library synced anymore in core solas because we have to keep the desktop going. We have to keep progressing there. We won't be able to maintain that compatibility forever in the main solas project, but we can take the core parts of solas and just layer some differences on top of that. So if we needed to change a couple of the libraries to fit in with that Steam stuff, we could easily do that. So whatever distribution you was on, you wouldn't be using the whole stuff you would just be using this runtime and that build of Steam and LSI, and it would just work the same everywhere. So it wouldn't matter if you was even on Slackware or something. It would just work the way it was meant to. So basically, the long and the short of all this is that if your distro supports snaps properly, then you'll be able to run Steam perfectly. 
Yep. There are going to be some teething issues, obviously. Um, we're going to have to... I've started pinging a few of the game devs up on Twitter and over on GitHub as well, but it, it's going to be a lot more of a solid start than we have now. Instead of people having to manually mangle the game's libraries and binaries and scripts to get things to work, they shouldn't have to do that anymore. Does that mean that you are actively encouraging and facilitating people to run proprietary software? Yeah. Nice one. Sweet. <laughs> um, a quick snap question, because you've been indoctrinated to the point where you know all about this. So yeah, yeah. Snaps are self-updating then. So how does that work? Again, briefly, if you can. Yep. Because <laughs> like, obviously with DEBs and RPMs and um, ER packages, you have to specifically run that. And you can set what is effectively a cron job with um, yep. uh, unattended upgrades. But so how do, do snaps just do it in the background or like I've, i don't have enough experience with it to know how okay long story short the snap d daemon runs in the background and there's a system d unit think of it very much like a cron like a cron job because it's just a system d timer unit and every so often that just tells it to run a command which is basically snap refresh so even if snap d isn't running it will be started and it would tell them to do the refreshes so if you enable that unit which we don't do in Solus by default. But if you enable that unit, then they would automatically upgrade in the background on a given timer. If there's nothing to be updated, then it doesn't get updated. It's just like doing like a pseudo apt update. No real difference. But if you want to do that manually, then it's pseudo snap refresh. It's very much the same as using the package manager, like pseudo apt update or pseudo EO package up. There's no real difference there. Yeah, so that's that's equivalent to dist upgrade then or, or an upgrade. Basically, yeah. I mean, you're just, you're, you just... <laughs> As much as they won't like it to be called a package manager, it kind of is. It just deals with a very different form of package. Right. So it seems that they've got their shit together then, basically. Yeah, I'd say so. And that it is going to become the standard. Because the more I hear about it, the more I think, well, yeah, that's quite sensible. And yeah, that's quite sensible. And Well, I mean, look at it this way, right? I mean, I've I've already had some people fall out me, sadly, of, <laughs> on Reddit, um, of course, over using Snap and not Flatpak. And it's always, well, you know, Flatpak does these things better. You know, there's, there's places where it's technically superior. And I agree with those points. But the, the reality that I see is that I see on one side, you know, <laughs> in the blue corner, I guess, uh, over with Canonical, they're funding money into the PR part of it and promoting it, whereas over on the Flatpak side, it's engineering resources, and that's it. There, There's no promotion there, there's no developer outreaches, there's none of that happening over there. And for me, I've got to think more in terms of the market than I would in terms of the technological capabilities because they both kind of do the sort of same core thing, which is run other things on other distros. But if you had to put two of them in a room and say, well, which one of these is most likely to win over bigger players in the market, it's going to be one that's throwing money at the market. But Flatpak doesn't even do services, though, does it? I don't actually know. I stopped paying attention to it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's desktop orientated, right? Yeah, that would make sense that it doesn't do services because it's not aimed at servers. Yeah. Yeah, whereas Snaps will automatically restart the services. And, you know, like uh, when I was running Nextcloud, it was just running after I installed it, which is kind of cool. Yeah. I've, I should try it. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't want to use the remote stuff, you can always just download the dot snaps locally and install them there, like if you're worried about the ownership side of things. Yeah. I just, I hate, like, I tried a DB in Docker, and that was just a nightmare. Ah, uh, yeah, so. Docker can be painful. So it just, it smells of the same thing, even if it isn't. It, it is, it's all up the same street. I mean, it's containers. Once that word is in there, everyone tries to run away with it. It's like, oh, no, no, it's not like those containers. But it kind of is, yeah. because you're using the same kernel features and a relocatable route. It's all the same stuff, just with different names and different use cases. Docker is, I will run forever and you can bring me up at a second's notice and I will update them. Snap is more, everything's at the foreground. But it's, yeah, it's all just relocatable containers, whatever way you want to look at it. It's Docker yeah. for desktops. <laughs> <laughs> but and servers as well, kind of. which Yeah, and servers as well. Like you can actually genuinely run server software with that, which is as much as it pains me to say that it's kind of good for the older services that you might need to be running. And you're, if you was a little bit concerned about security, it's like, eh, 
get sandboxed, you know, to an yeah. extent, obviously it's not, it's not a VM. There are still things that you need to take precautions against, but it's a little bit of peace of mind. Well, the updates thing is really relevant to IoT. I think that's where oh, yeah. snaps yeah. are really going to shine. And IoT is where we're going to see the worst effects of cracks. Oh, look at the segue. Now, can we just get this out of the way at the beginning? So it, it's called crack, which is key reinstallation attacks. Now, this has been put together by someone who has never spent any time in the United Kingdom because the sub headline is breaking WPA2 by forcing nonce reuse. <laughs> now, <laughs> anyone in the UK would say, no, you definitely don't want to reuse a nonce. You don't. <laughs> you don't want to use one in the first nope. place. <laughs> Of course, a nonce, it means something that is unique once and then is gone again. So a word or an idea that comes once and then disappears and it is unique in history, which is what some of the keys and stuff that are involved in these handshakes should be. But there are ways to force the reuse of these nonces. <laughs> For our American uh, <laughs> listeners... <laughs> Look up the word nonce and you'll see why we are amused, even if we shouldn't be. So anyway, the the serious point here is that Wi-Fi is fucked, basically. WPA2 is used basically everywhere, apart from in some enterprise things. Like WPA2 Enterprise, I don't think is affected by this that we know of. But basically every device, every router, every IoT device is fucked until it gets patched which okay windows have already patched it um android will patch it probably in a few weeks if you are lucky in a few years if you're not and never if you're a normal person um this is really fucking bad man it makes me want to use ethernet cables again yeah it was the point i was making earlier my phone manufacturer is being a bastard and he's just thinking about that but you then have to look at something else. And with the best will in the world, someone has found a way around uh, the security of the thing that makes everything work. Like Wi-Fi is ubiquitous. And so it's a case of even even with open protocols and, and code that is used by loads of people, it just seems that one of these events is going to happen every fortnight, every six months, you know, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And for the for the fundamental way in which all the devices communicate with each other to be broken uh is uh like you say joe bad for bad day for the internet yeah i, I have two routers one of them was because the router that i initially installed was a pf sense box built on a sort of a, a like a single board computer type thing hang on pf sense Yes, I know. The only there was no Linux based one I could use at the time, and it was just it was a nice piece of kit, so I went for it. I know it's getting updated. I feel dirty every time I I download packets from the internet. But anyway, uh, what's what's it getting updated to? Well, it's going to get updated to uh, like that'll get patched because they are constantly update it, update it all the time. Sorry, okay, I thought you meant you were changing it from PF Sense to something else. But yeah, okay, the update's coming for that. No, no, but I I also have a Netgear one because ah a small dig at BSD the driver for the wireless chipset wasn't great and would drop off the connection now and again so i had to get a separate bit of kit so i bought a 30 quid tp link i think it's tp link or is it netgear god i can't remember and shoved it in a cupboard and went all right there there we go there's a second network we can use that and i know for a fact that thing's not going to get patched so i'm going to have to go in with the claw end of a hammer into that unit and <laughs> rip it out the wall and fling that in the bin and create more e-waste and go buy a new one and you know bloody annoying but if that router had been running a snap based system then it could have been updatable i mean i know i don't want to yeah. seem like some snap advocate they've got plenty of people getting paid for that but snap it, good. <laughs> oh, <Jesus. laughs> but like it does sound like it would be the solution to this problem yeah it's got to be because i mean you can go on and on about proprietary versus free whatever but i mean you, we can't just keep chucking stuff in a bin just for the sake of somebody can't be arsed to update the software on it you know, and I imagine it's it's probably not even a big patch. It's probably a, 
you know, it's a few lines uh, he says, not knowing a clue of what's in that firmware. But well, Ike, you've patched this today. I've seen them today. Uh, there was eight patches that needed to be applied to WPA Supplicant 2.6. They were also nice enough, the offers of WPA Supplicant, to provide the rebased version so you could apply them directly to 2.6 or, if you really wanted to, a Bleeding Edge version WPA Supplicant. And Arch Linux, Fedora, Ubuntu, Solus, so obviously Debian as well as in there, have all got those updates out today which means probably most of the distributions have got them out, and we've all been able to do it in no time at all. And so could the fucking device manufacturers. Don't connect it to the internet if you're not going to fucking update it. Well, yeah, if they had the infrastructure to do it, because the thing is that Linux distros and Windows and Mac and all the rest of it have that distribution method. They have the infrastructure in place to push updates, whereas most routers need to be manually flashed yeah but they don't care either that's the thing it's to make the cheapest possible thing fling it over the wall then disappear and in some cases fold the company that might be involved with it because they disappear after a short time so i mean how worried should we be about this do you think given that every device in the world is fucked well it's your phones you gotta worry about now it's the android phones and not only that, you, you, you've got your Bluetooth as well that you've got that only happened, what, was yeah. a week or two weeks ago. <laughs> and the iOS thing not long ago as well, where it was attacking the Broadcom firmware directly over Wi-Fi. <laughs> We're fucked, lads. We may just we may just give in altogether. Like. Yeah, I, it does make me want to not use my phone out and about, but I kind of need to. It makes it scary, doesn't it? Like, you don't know what on who to trust anymore. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, I'm not bothered, but fuck it. Looks at Twitter again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> there, these things are going to be happening all the time. There's always going to be some part of the stack or some well-established protocol that becomes insecure again. Uh, basically, it's going to be a case of choose who you trust. Like, don't buy from shit manufacturers anymore. We're getting to a point, finally, where it's like, hmm, maybe the throwaway consumer society we have built for ourselves... Isn't quite the best approach. <laughs> yeah. Well, I came home from work and uh, wanted to show my missus the hilarious thing about the nonces. Um, <laughs> and uh, she already knew about the story. It's it's on the mainstream news. So oh, wow. maybe. Did, maybe wait, did they will. actually do that over in England as well? Like have it up in the news. It's like, nonces attack the internet. <laughs> <laughs> please say they did that <laughs> no i don't think they use the word nonces thankfully uh, but uh, they they talked about wi-fi is or uh, security wi-fi or uh, i think that's pretty much the the crux of that but people are hearing about it and maybe this will be a catalyst for change yeah but yeah, no, the bbc has said that it's all linux's fault somehow yeah, uh, open source the <laughs> they <laughs> broke the <laughs> stuff not that we failed to maintain it <laughs> yeah all right then, so this episode of Late Night Linux is sponsored by Entroware, and Entroware are a dedicated Linux computer seller based here in the UK, and they sell computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate 1604 and 1704, but presumably 1710 almost by the time you hear this, um, and they're a company who cares about Linux. It's run by a couple of really cool dudes who came to old camp a couple of years ago and we met and realized that they they care you know they're not just a company that also sells a few linux things and they kind of dipping their toes into it this is a company that is all about linux so if you want a laptop or a desktop or even they've got a server then go to entroware.com and check out what they've got they've got everything from low end stuff that's kind of just basic browsing and email um, focused all the way up to real powerhouses with the latest NVIDIA cards in them that you can do graphic design and 3D art and video editing and that sort of thing. And most stuff is configurable, so you can decide how much RAM you're going to go for and SSD and that sort of thing, and you can upgrade the processors. And they ship to the UK, the Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And if you do buy one of their machines, then do mention us at checkout, and then they'll know that Late Night Linux sent you. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. So a bit of admin then. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon. It's very much appreciated. Um, And you can go to latenightlinux.com slash support if you want to join them. 
And you can go to latenightlinux.com slash contact for all the ways to get in touch with us. I think that's it. There's not really anything to mention this week, is there? So let's get into Ubuntu 17.10. Now, there has to be a big asterisk on this. We've been checking out the the daily images. It's due for release on Thursday. It's now Monday night as we record this. So it's basically, if they haven't fixed it by now, then it's not looking good that they're going to have fixed it. But I think we will overlook some bugs and stuff because it is pre-release just about. But I think you get the idea of it anyway. So I don't know who to start with. I suppose, Phelim, you are a KDE man. So this is totally different for you going to GNOME. I presume you haven't really used GNOME for a while. I must say, I was never against Unity. I was of the opinion that if I wasn't able to use KD and I had to use Unity like as a work laptop or something like that, I would have been fine to do it. I was never hostile to it, I guess, because I, I didn't have the whole history with GNOME sort of thing. So maybe I wasn't, you know, I just wasn't as invested in it. Like if someone told me, right, KD's, everybody's been shot. It was part of KD and we've deleted all the, all the data. Right, you have to use Unity now. No worries. <laughs> It would have been fine. So, I mean, to me, because I haven't used Unity in a while, looking at this, I'm half thinking it looks very, very similar, and I'm not entirely sure what the differences are. All right, well, Jesse, you used Unity for a long time for a while. So do you concur with that sentiment? Yeah, I think asking Phelim what he thinks of GNOME is is actually a not quite the right question because it's so like Unity and they've done a, you know, a fantastic job in taking GNOME and tweaking it and making amendments and the look and feel and the placement of icons and positions and colours and all that kind of stuff to make it really, really similar to Unity and they've done a fantastic job. There are obvious differences like they haven't got the HUD, they haven't got, is that what the pop-up used to be called? I think it was the HUD. I just don't want to get my terminology wrong but if you press start... Uh, super key part of me and the there's a the main pop-up that used to come up on unity obviously now it's gnome and it's the gnome app launcher um and so there there are those sort of obvious things when you switch between desktops they're tiled downwards rather than left and right on most desktop environments but it is a it you know, is credit to the to the desktop team who have taken GNOME and made it look so familiar to people, and hence why I think Phelim didn't see the difference. Um, but that said, I kind of wanted to then tweak it with some different icons and move stuff about, and I found it very difficult to do those things I wanted to do. I couldn't find uh, a way of change icons very easily, hence I was looking in the settings menu and we referred to it, or I referred to it earlier in the show. They've got the the new GNOME settings menu with uh, the scrollable options on the side. And I, I found it a bit difficult to sort of make it my own way. And then I remembered that that's kind of how Unity always was. In fairness, that's kind of how GNOME is believe it or not it's kind of hard to configure gnome how you want it to be they no longer have any options built in for changing your theme your icon theme anything like that it's all been relegated to gnome tweak tool yeah yeah so i agree entirely and gnome tweak tool is the way that i would or i have done that isn't it called gnome tweaks now did they shorten it oh they can't decide it's still gnome tweak tool to me just like it's nautilus as well yeah, that's no, files. Mm. <laughs> Boxes. Mm. But I mean, even even from the install, it looked the same. You know, it looked like they probably use the same installer, I assume. But uh, it looked like uh, Ubiquity, is it? It is, yeah. Yeah, it, all very smooth. You know, it felt like I was installing a standard Ubuntu from uh, six months, a year ago. Uh, and it remembered my Wi-Fi from the live version of uh, the live install through to the actual final install um and it, the only difference was that when it when it started up it didn't have that uh shortcut sort of uh overlay that shows you all the super key shortcuts you can do the one that says hold down the super key to bring this back that no one ever sees and then no one ever sees that <laughs> yeah. thing again <laughs> where's, where's it gone it's lost forever <laughs> so yeah. it's a super key to do that yeah <laughs> well it used to be all right cheers <laughs> um r- one thing that struck me was they've gone through all these changes, they've totally restructured the company, they've made the massive change back to GNOME, and it's you know they've spent ages doing the the polishing of it and everything, and then you you open it up and it's like oh yeah they've still got an Amazon link, 
Mm. Yeah, nice one. That was really popular back in the day, and it's uh, mm, this was a fresh start for the sake of the how many thousand quid are they making from that? Probably not that many. They they could have just turned over a new leaf made a fresh start all those cliches but instead it's still there and when you go to uninstall it in the software center the reviews of it are so funny it's like this is still in here i can't believe it just get rid of it and just no stars and all the rest of it so surely that's nostalgia at this point though right well yeah i suppose and some people would say it's a minor thing but to me it just seems really fucking unprofessional and i just can't believe that amazon has allowed them to do this deal because from what i know of certainly the podcasting world, not that I've ever been involved directly, but people who I've spoken to about it, once you get to a certain success with the Amazon affiliate link, which is effectively what this is, they cut you off and they just find bullshit ways to cut you off. So if they were making any real money from it, then they wouldn't be making any money because they would have been cut off by now. So it just seems like, I don't know. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but just for fuck's sake, don't do it in the LTS. Okay, so I'll go with a full-out positive then uh, to counter that. And Bluetooth is fantastic. I know they've put a lot of effort into it on this release. Uh, It's been on some of the updates, uh, announcements they've been talking about. And I use Bluetooth a lot, mostly through my phone, but headphones, Bluetooth speaker all day long when I'm dicking around at home. And so wanted to test that. And it connects so quickly, finds stuff really quickly, reconnects, you know, it's much, much, much better than Bluetooth has ever been on Linux. So that is a a massive win for Ubuntu. Hopefully that's going to trickle down to the other distros as well because Bluetooth has been a disaster on Linux for a very long time. Well, since ever. So yeah, well done. I didn't actually test Bluetooth because I didn't have it on the laptop that I was testing it on. But that makes me consider it for certain other devices now. Oh, also they make the transition from Windows and as a Windows user at work, I'm very used to using Start correctly named uh left and right for moving windows to the left half the right half full screen that kind of stuff and i think other desktops do it but um they've implemented that as well so super key left and right enables you to move your uh windows around i guess it's a gnome thing now i think about it but it does it does mean that windows users transition very easily i know that as a you know a starter distro or noob distro uh the one that a lot of people go to, Ubuntu, it, it works well for Ubuntu to have that for people to transition easily. So that's a good a good thing to have. Yeah, it's definitely a GNOME feature. Um, I've never used it before until you just said it, but it works on Budgie as well. So it's an upstream GNOME being cool thing. All right, well, can we talk about software? So I always do the VLC test. It's something I've done for years for various reasons, even though I don't really use VLC that much anymore. But anyway... So you search for VLC in software and you find two different versions. Now, I know, because I know about these things, that one is a snap and one is a deb, but it doesn't say anything about that. And it just seems confusing to users. Why are the two different versions? Well, can I pause you there, Joe? Is there any way that you knew which one was a snap and which one was a deb? No. I kind of assumed that the top one was and then it was. Or was it the bottom one? I can't remember. The top one was what? uh, Snap. Right, okay. Sorry, yeah, I should have been clearer there. And I I had an instinct for which one was the Snap and which one was the Deb. And I got it right. My instinct was correct. But the average user is just going to be confused by that. And it makes me think that if they're going to go all in on Snap, which they clearly are, and we've talked about the benefits of it already on this show, why not just only have snaps in that if if there is a snap of the thing that you're searching for just show the snap and don't show the deb of it and if there are no snaps and only a deb then show the deb it, it just feels like if you're going to commit to snaps to the point that they are prominently featured in the results of a, a search for software then you must be confident enough in it to not show the deb do you have a snap deb preference no well i uh, yes <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> Deb, obviously. But um, at the same time, I'm growing fonder of Snaps. It seems that they, you're going to get the later versions of, it, of software and it's generally going to be better as a result. Well, you say that. Have you tried that VLC Snap? 
uh, briefly, and it seemed to work reasonably well. The VLC strap is deeply, 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 deeply broken and very, 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 very old. So if I were supposed to, which I am not, I would make sure to actively blacklist some of those snaps because they will lead to a very poor user experience. Oh, well, I tried it out and it played videos, no problem. And They have no theme integration in the VLC snap. It's not been updated since January. So the version in Deb is actually going to be newer, better, and more integrated than the snap one. So is that why they are just hedging their bets and showing you both then? Um, I think it's actually to do with the way GNOME software works uh, in terms of the plugin priority. But f- for some of those, they really should hide them because they have their own VLC, which works perfectly fine. So this old snap then presumably has got that subtitle bug in it, the security vulnerability. I don't know. Well, it might do, because that was only a few months ago, or I'm getting old. That was probably about three years ago. But it's sandboxed, Joe. True, it's sandboxed. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you can definitely rely on that all the time. Uh, but back to how awesome Ubuntu is. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't care for the, the massive changes that they've made, such as having a proper desktop that you can actually clutter up, excellent, and um, having proper window controls on the correct side. No. If you don't like any of that stuff, <laughs> then you can just install one package, can't you, to get a completely stock GNOME, uh, which is just GNOME-session. Can you? Ah. Yes, which I did, and sure enough, you log out, and then you've got four potential login sessions, which are uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu on Xorg, and then GNOME on the two of them wayland or xorg and it all seems to work perfectly well and then logging into vanilla stock gnome made me think Ugh, i really don't like it i didn't like unity there is no <laughs> there's no point in me trying to hide that but i think that i dislike gnome more than i disliked unity and so given the choice it's just a no-brainer i'd far rather use this latest version of ubuntu which is it's kind of GNOME, but it's kind of Unity. It's as close to Unity as they could make by the looks of things in the few months that they had. So I wonder, you know, I'm sure Ike has a couple of comments he'd like to make, but given your point there about how similar it is to Unity, and, and I would echo that as well, do you think that uh, um, System76 was right to make Pop! OS? No. And their fear of it, <laughs> of their users being shocked and horrored by the, the entirely new look. No, I think it was a knee-jerk reaction to make Pop! OS, and it was a fucking ridiculous idea. Okay. Uh, Ike, <laughs> any... <laughs> what, am I wrong? <laughs> no. Um, I won't use quite the same terms, but they were very reactionary. And I think the way things have played out since, it's... the. The, the podium that they were stood on is very, very weak now, to put it in the politest of terms. <laughs> Reid, I agree with Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Not explicitly. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, if they end up doing something good, that's great, fantastic. I would love to be proven wrong. Yet to see any evidence of that yet. Um, because my opinion of this is they're not just another distro out there they're also a quote hardware company end quote so i would like to see them do it right so i'm still seeing which way it goes but the way that things have gone so far with the way that they've done gnome now in the latest ubuntu i don't really think anyone would care anymore it's like oh this is just like an updated stack because when you moved between the previous versions of ubuntu there were always changes slight refinement it's gonna feel like that to most people now going to the new ubuntu there's not any real differences apart from the HUD. I think the average user, or I suppose System76 isn't aimed at the average user, are they? True, they're aimed at scientists and 3D printers. And... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, there was a bit of bitchiness to be had. All right, now we can move on. <laughs> yeah, and developers as well. Developers, developers, developers. 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 <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Well, Pop! OS, it remains to be seen. I haven't looked at it for a little while i probably should have done but that it, last time i looked at it it was just sort of stock gnome with a quite a nice theme i thought but 
I'm sure they have great plans for it, and you kind of have to start somewhere. But um, yeah, maybe... they've not played all their cards yet. Yeah. Uh, we haven't talked about the flavors. I suppose maybe we could wait till next week and talk about them. I mean, for me, really, it's only Ubuntu Mate that is relevant in uh, in terms of anything new. Um, Martin has done a lot of work on that as well. Like, yeah, if you follow any of these Google Plus stuff or the Ubuntu Mate blog. Like I know for a long time, people who consider Mate is just the traditional desktop. But as well as being the traditional metaphor, he has done quite a few things there. Like they've actually got their own HUD over there as well. <laughs> well, yeah, they've replicated a lot of the Unity stuff. So if yeah. you if this uh, mainstream Ubuntu isn't Unity like enough for you, then you've got another option. And okay, nothing's going to be quite exactly the same as Unity was, but the mutiny layout with the HUD and everything is pretty close by the looks of things. So it's and a refreshed theme as well yeah although my understanding is high dpi support is uh not great yeah it's considerably weaker in mate that is an ongoing thing they're working to resolve but uh wimpy does have some ongoing patches for that so there is testing and i mean being him i'm pretty sure once it's stable they'll just push it out as an update to be honest like in the stable channel yeah, and to be fair, who's got a high DPI screen? I know you have, but even yeah, if... but even I don't use it, do I? Mine's yeah. put down to 1080. Yeah, does it look blurry? Like if I've got uh, a 1080 no, no, screen, no. it looks wrong at, at any other resolution. Uh, I mean, when I first switched it back over, it did feel like because I just done 4K, it's like I can't see anything. I don't understand numbers anymore. But um, <laughs> I mean, it's like a 28 inch monitor, so I mean, you'd have to be fairly fucking blind. <laughs> for that to be blurry <laughs> at any given resolution <laughs> so yeah it's a 1080 on hdmi i'm well used to it again so it's not blurry to me i yeah. don't think i could go back to 4k i'm pretty sure i would develop paper cuts on my eyes <laughs> <laughs> um all right well we should kind of sum it up i suppose so failing this is negative in the kde dimension it is i mean so, <laughs> the, the thing i like about kde is the apps so the apps aren't here <laughs> so well you can pull down a load of dependencies uh, and run no, them and have I the think if, if you go to a desktop environment i think you should stick in it i don't advocate the cross pollination that a lot of people do but hey <laughs> So you've got no intention of switching to this. There's just no way that's going to happen. I know. It's just not for me. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's nice. I, I really appreciate the work they've put into it. I really like it. It looks good. Uh, functions well. I mean, I would recommend it to people. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So say you've got um, a friend or whatever, and they're willing to convert to Linux. It seems logical that Ubuntu is the way to go. Sorry, IK. But um, what flavor? Like Ubuntu as a base, but then what flavor? For me, I don't know. There's a a balance there between what is going to be the most usable for that person, and what am I using so I can support them more easily. And I tend to just drift towards XFCE, which is well. It's generally the people I convert have got knackered old hardware, so it doesn't make sense to use anything heavier. But that's a very long way of asking you, Fadim. Would it be neon that you'd put on someone's? laptop for them or would it be this or would it be another flavor if i'm supporting them i'd probably put neon on it because give me a week and i'd have forgotten how to do anything in this because i wouldn't use it properly and yeah but i mean that said the great advantage is the fact that so many people do use it and there is a big company behind it and you know they're a professional outfit you you can debate that as much as you want but they are and it's nice to be able to say here you go, here's this thing, loads of people use it, and, you know, they'll look after you if you need to. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd be torn. Um, I guess I, I I would base it on who was there. Um, if it was somebody that, you know, I was leaving it to, and they were maybe a bit more noobish, maybe, then I probably would give them a bun to, to be honest. All right, well, Ike, we know that you are not going to use this because you use Solus and you wouldn't recommend it because you would recommend Solus. So we could probably... Not for desktop use cases. It all depends on what people have to do. Yeah. Like if somebody was, say, engineering or maths orientated, then no, I probably wouldn't send them to Solus because we're more of a mainstream desktop system. For those more periphery cases, then yeah, I probably would send them over to the Ubuntu land. All right. And in Ubuntu land, would it be this or would it be a flavor? 
I with this one mainly because it has the backing of the main team, and that's to me these things now come down to who's got their money involved in it. Yeah. All right, fair enough. So Jesse, you have flirted with many different desktop environments, and you're kind of a gnome man these days. I know that you use Arch because you're a fucking hipster, but would you consider going back to it <laughs> for this? Uh, I'm very likely to be putting Ubuntu back onto my machines, and uh, now, that, especially now, I know there's a way of easily getting straight GNOME on there. Uh, I think it's going to be using good. DD. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I managed to make my USB stick for this very successfully. Thank you. <laughs> Did you use a GUI tool this time? Uh, no, despite. Uh, a presentation on it at Odd Camp. I forgot like how we did. Oh, for how we fuck's did sake! It. <laughs> Fair so so uh, you are tempted to go back and um, after your fuck up with your recording the other, uh, I think it was two episodes ago, and that was because it was in a cupboard you claimed or in a drawer or something. But anyway, so you are tempted to go back to proper Ubuntu and just use stock GNOME though. Yeah, yeah, that's my plan. I've I've found enough quirks and issues on other distros that all just work on Ubuntu, and uh, I, I can do without the headache. May I ask why Stock Gnome and not the tweaks that they've made? Mm, I mean, my current answer is because of Gnome Tweak Tool, and someone may well be listening saying, oh, you can put it on you know, the stock one and do whatever you like. But starting from an unadulterated version with a Gnome Tweak Tool to change the icons and things to how I like them, then... That's how I like it. I, I genuinely can't stand most of the colors and icons and all that kind of stuff that Ubuntu use. So ripping them out and putting new ones in, I might as well just go straight with, with GNOME. Fair enough. And as for me, no, not not a chance. XSCE. Um, well, it's working for me. Maybe if I get a 4K screen and realize how shit XFCE is on that, then I might think, oh, right, I need to do something else there. But just nothing is able to tempt me away from what I've been using for all these years, quite frankly. It just works well enough for me, so I'm not going to use it. And would I recommend it? I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe, maybe. But then there's that support thing that we talked about with failing there. I wouldn't remember how to do it. I know how to support XFCE over the phone and stuff, so... Well, you know how to fix that problem, don't you? Like, if, you, if you're if you in the predicament of getting family and friends over to Linux and you're wondering, what should I give them? Because, you know, it's going to get to the point where they're going to phone me up and say, blah, 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 this thing's gone wrong. Give them fucking Gentoo or Gentoo or however you want to say it. Give them Arch. Give them Void Linux if you really must. <laughs> they will never go near Linux again. And you will be free of support queries, like, for another six months, right? Do you know, even even for bastard points, right, to say remove nsswitch.conf and resolve.conf so they can't even fucking internet, right? Set them up real proper and you'll never get those queries again. You will feel great. You know, they would have dipped their toes and said, oh, fuck it, that burns. You know, everyone's a winner. I'm trying to advocate here, I keep. Oh, advocate. All oh, right. All oh, right. Sorry. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, well, uh, we might be totally wrong. And it, uh, last time there was a major release, I think Shotworth threw in some stuff at the last minute that made uh, a lot of people embarrassed by their reviews. But I don't think that's going to happen this time. I think it's going to be pretty much as we've talked about it. But in two weeks, we'll come back and maybe talk about any little differences that were there for the final release. But uh, in the meantime, then, I have been Joe. I've been less freshly showered. I've been dying to get out in the wind. And I've been dying to get away from his wind. <laughs> <sighs> See you later. <laughs> See you, Slan. <laughs>